Hello everyone, just a heads up, it's about two minutes until three, so we'll get started right at three o'clock. Thank you.
Good afternoon, students, faculty, student facilitators, and our special guests. My name is Gina Baugh, and I'm the Director of Interprofessional Education at the WVU Health Sciences Center. I'd like to welcome you all to our fourth interprofessional education session for the 2020-2021 academic year. Today, we're going to focus on the final of the four competencies of IPE, which is communications. Over the next two hours, you will have the opportunity to hear a physician give his first hand account of living with substance use disorder and the importance of collaboration and communication in his care. You will then have the opportunity to work with your IPE teams to interview two standardized patients using appropriate language and trying to avoid, avoid stigmatizing language. Um, I will now move on to our next slide, which just reminds you, gives a good overview of the four core competencies of interprofessional education. As you all remember, over the past several months, we've worked through these competencies. Starting back in September, we started our journey um, with our Flipgrid videos, looking at the roles and responsibilities for collaborative practice. We then move through um, the game scenario with the patient um, using the Abilify My Site case with the Choose Your Own Adventure game, really, really focusing on the values and ethics um, for interprofessional practice. Then this past semester, about a month ago, we traveled through the mistake room where we learned the import importance of working together because of through teamwork and collaboration. And then this is our final of these sessions for this academic year for IPE. And we're really going to dive more deeply into IPE communications, but we'll really see that all four core competencies really come together as we move from the didactic or classroom scenarios into these standardized patient simulated encounters. So for the session outline, um, I'm going to in a moment, turn it over to Dr. Aaron Wynn Stanley. Um, and as I mentioned, um, we will then have a lived experience presentation. You will then log off of this Zoom session and join your individual Zoom group rooms, which they are all posted on Seoul under the IPE Seoul site. We'll then get the opportunity to have two standardized patient encounters. And then finally, we will have an overall uh, debriefing. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Aaron Wynn Stanley, who is the Vice Chair of Research and an Associate Professor in the Department of Behavioral Medicine and Psychiatry at WVU. She'll provide opening remarks and introduce our speaker. So enjoy the session, have a great time, and I look forward to having a really educational next two hours with all of you. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me to be part of this presentation today. I just wanted to start off by um, reminding everyone that substance use disorders are a chronic relapsing disorder um, whereby individuals compulsively use drugs despite their negative consequences. We know that it affects the brain circuits uh, that are associated with self-control, reward, stress uh, are all affected by the use of alcohol and other substances. The ideology of a Substance use disorders is really a complex combination of biology and genes and environment, but also the route of administration the drug is used, the effects of the drugs, early use, availability, um, and a lot of other uh, aspects that lead to how it affects your brain and the development of, of substance use disorders. We do know that um, substance use disorders uh, are a chronic disease and they have rates of relapse that are uh, consistent with other chronic diseases like hypertension and asthma. What we're gonna be doing today in the sessions is uh, really focusing on identification and brief interventions and referral to treatment. Uh, this formal method, screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment is known by the acronym ESPER. ESPERT is a strategy to identify problematic alcohol or drug use. It is also a tool that can be used to identify patients that potentially need treatment for a substance use disorder. As part of an ESPERT intervention, you can use existing screening tools and you'll also engage in brief intervention to assess the patient's readiness for positive behavior change and using motivational interviewing to foster change talk. The emphasis here really is on a patient-centered approach to communication, listening to what the patient's needs are and desires are for behavior change, 
and reinforcing their positive uh, aspects and helping them to uh, make small incremental changes to improve their health. Some of the expert tools that was made available to you um, and that may be helpful in fostering some of this change talk include things like a readiness ruler, where you might ask on a scale from zero to 10, how important is it for you to change right now? Thinking about that change behavior and reducing someone's alcohol use and or reducing or their importance of seeking addiction treatment. Or you might ask how confident is the person to understand their internal efficacy and, and commitment to making the change that you're discussing. While thinking about this and discussing alcohol use with patients, keep in mind what the alcohol safe drinking limits are for men and women. And for men, it's no more than four drinks per day um, or 14 drinks per week. For women, it's no more than three drinks per day and no uh, more than seven drinks per week. And again, thinking about the readiness to change for a better social behavior. In terms of treatment, we use the DSM uh, as a tool to assess for a clinical diagnosis of a substance use disorders. While sometimes it's common in communities to use the terms substance abuse or substance dependence, that is antiquated language from an older version of the DSM. The appropriate terminology to use now is substance use disorders. According to the DSM criteria, two to three symptoms suggest a mild disorder, whereas four to five is a moderate disorder and six plus is a severe disorder. Symptoms really focus on a constellation of impaired control, social or role problems in fulfilling your obligations and risky use despite negative consequences and drug effects such as tolerance that may engage the person using more over uh, than they intend to over a greater period of time. The common treatments that are available for the evidence-based treatments, I should say, for uh, substance use disorders include psychosocial therapy, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy and pharmacotherapies that have been approved by the FDA. You should have received in your handout some recommended language. It's really important to consider using um, medically accurate, patient-centered, respectful language in communicating with patients that are using alcohol or drugs and or may have a substance use disorder. Um, using terms like addict and junkie is derogatory and really needs to not occur. Uh, and you can use terms like a patient with a substance use disorder. It's also medically inaccurate to talk about a dirty urine drug screen. So think about using terms like a positive or negative urine or blood toxicology test result. Less than 80% of individuals with a substance use disorder seek treatment. And in part, this is due to stigma. So it's really critical to ensure medically accurate terminology and person first language to reduce stigma and create pathways to recovery for patients. Without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Hogan. He earned his medical degree in 2009 from the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine. He is currently an adjunct professor at Duquesne University and a drug and alcohol therapist at the Greenbrier Treatment Center. Previous to this position, Dr. Hogan worked as a hospitalist at Camden Clark Medical Center, and he was also an emergency medicine physician there. Thank you again, personally, Dr. Hogan, for presenting today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation and we will uh, have an opportunity for questions at the end. Again, thank you and uh, it's all yours. All right. Thank you guys. Um, thanks, Amy. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, uh, Gina. Thanks, uh, WVU, for allowing me to uh, come in and speak today. Um, and just thanks for bearing with us as we've, this has been, uh, this was scheduled last year, but due to COVID, we weren't able to actually um, do it. Um, so just a brief introduction about me. Um, uh, again, I, I did. I grew up in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Um, I, 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 I gained my uh, medical degree from West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, and I can, like, looking back at my, my education, I can... I can think back at a lot of holes in the substance use disorder um, education. Um, when I think back of anything that we, we learned, it, the education was kind of poor, um, very scattered, and, and we didn't really spend a whole lot of time on substance use disorder. The, what we did learn was 
um, very textbook, very, um, this is what a, a standard uh, stereotyped uh, individual with substance use disorder looks like. So really my, my understanding of uh, substance use disorder from, a, from an education perspective was, was kind of lacking in that um, I kind of saw the, each individual was somebody that was the, the stereotypical under a bridge, homeless, very thin, emaciated, no teeth, pick marks, like the things that you see in, in movies and television shows as individuals, individuals with substance use disorder, how they're depicted is, is kind of how the medical education was at least um, centered uh, 10 years ago. Um, so, and even from a clinical experience, I can, I can think back to several interactions with working in, in medical school rotations, working in residency rotations, um, just where the medical staff in, in general had a very negative outlook on individuals with substance use disorder, very stigmatized, very condescending, very, oh, here, he or she is again, he just wants his drugs, she just wants her fix, et cetera, et cetera. And so it kind of had this, um, even from a medical standpoint, was still fairly stigmatized. Um, and, and, and with that stigma become, comes judgment, judgment against the individual rather than understanding of the disease itself. Um, and really, the, a lot of the mindsets in the, in the medical professions and, and people um, with loved ones with substance use disorders, in my experience, just why don't they just stop? Why, why don't you just stop using? If you love me, you just stop using. Uh, if you loved your children, you'd just stop using. And that's just through personal experience, I can say is absolutely not possible. Um, I can uh, talk about my story a little bit. Um, I can, my first exposure was actually to opiates at a really young age. I, uh, I had a knee surgery when I was 11 years old and um, actually the first of, I think, seven knee surgeries total. And uh, I was prescribed um, Vicodin at, a, at, a, at the age of 11. And I, at that point, I didn't even know what addiction was. I didn't know what alcoholism was. I didn't really know anything. I just knew that um, when I came home, I was given this pill as part of my, my treatment when I came home. And I, I still remember like when my when my mom gave me the pill, I remember 15 minutes later, real, remembering like how, how good the, the medication made me feel. And then ended up when, after my mom left, like I took another one. So that was probably, that would have been my first um, use of a, of a prescription opiate that was against medical um, indications. And at the age of 11, not really having any understanding of what, um, what addiction was. Um, when I progressed throughout the rest of my my teenage years, adulthood, al alcohol was a was a big part of my my social circle. Um, pretty much everybody that I associated with um, drank alcohol. Um, it was it was just it was socially acceptable, and it was what I used to 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 deal with some insecurities and some fears and and things like that. And um, I mean, not when I look back at, at my high school years, my college years, um, I definitely drank more than other people did. Um, when I started drinking, I might only drink once a week, but when I did drink, it was excessive and problematic. It might only be Friday night, but it would be all night until I, I blacked out. Um, and that in and of itself should have been a red flag for me that, hey, something's something's not right. Whenever I start drinking, I can't stop. Um, but I mean, I, I still continue to do the, do these things. And I started to, to gain some consequences. Um, I mean, I had been pulled over a number of times, um, especially in high school, but nothing really ever seemed to happen due to either being able to talk my way out of it or knowing the officer or my family knowing the officer. So no real consequences ever came of my, my, um, my drinking. And it just kind of allowed me to continue to, to do what I was doing. Um, and uh, in medical school, I had a, I had a DUI 
my third year of medical school that I had to go in front of the, the board and nothing really seemed to happen. I had to, to let explain what happened. Um, and that was the last I really heard of it. Um, and then there was another incident where I was in medical school and I was in a, I was in a pretty large bar fight that uh, was just me continuing to do these things despite consequences. Um, but they didn't really seem that big of a deal at the time and nothing was really, nothing was happening. So I didn't really think they were that serious. So I just continued to live my life like nothing really was going on. Um, so I, I finished um, medical school, I finished residency um, and I became um, an emergency medicine physician at Camden Clark uh, Medical Center in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Um, lots of exposure to substance use disorder in, in internal medicine residency, definitely a lot of exposure in um, emergency room setting. Um, still carrying that, that kind of stigma that um, addiction is this disease of choice. People are, uh, the, the men and women that come in with this disease are just trying to manipulate me out of medications. Um, just that stigma, stigma that uh, is carried through with, um, with substance use disorder. Um, so my experience with um, individuals with substance use disorder is that they, they kind of felt like a, a hot potato, like every profession, every specialty, it, it seemed like it was dealt with as a not my problem. They'd come into the emergency department, they're told to go to pain management, they'd go to pain management, they're told to go to psychiatry, they'd go to psychiatry, they'd be told to go to internal medicine. And it's just be kind of bounced around and all they really want is some help. Um, and they're not really knowing where to, where to find it. And um, so that whole concept of it's not my problem uh, carried along with in uh, especially internal medicine and emergency medicine. Um, I can say that my experience with prescription opiates uh, started um, my second night as an attending physician. I had, uh, I, I took care of a, there was a pediatric code blue that was called over over the PA system. And I was the only attending on that night. And when the, the girl came in, um, she was a, a drowning victim and, uh, and working her up, she was, um, she, it had been seen that she had been raped um, and, uh, and apparently drowned or attempted to be drowned by, by an attacker. Um, and there was a whole lot of just frustration, fear, anger, resentment, a lot of things that were going on inside of me during that time. And then in that period afterwards that I refused to talk about, um, I was a brand new attending physician, 29 years old. I carried this mindset of, I should be able to handle this without talking to anybody. I should be able to deal with this. I shouldn't have to ask for help. Um, if I ask for help, I'm going to be seen as weak and all these things that just kind of kept me stuck. Um, I even had a point where, um, one of the HR, um, representatives from the hospital, the, the same night that that happened had reached out to me and my now ex-wife just offering her services. And if I needed to talk to anybody and then periodically she would, she would reach out and ask if, if I needed to, to talk to anybody. And, and I just continued to say no, just because I didn't feel like I really I should, I should be able to handle this myself. Um, and I couldn't, uh, my alcohol became started to get worse. I drank more, but it just, the alcohol wasn't cutting it anymore. Um, I was close with some other professionals and some other, and some nurses. And, um, I got close with one of the nurses and she too had a substance use disorder and she had, uh, offered me some a prescription opiate to help sleep because I was having, I was having some flashbacks. I was having trouble sleeping. I just refused to talk about anything. And I wanted to try to deal with it on my own. And I was just, I was doing a very bad job at it. Um, so I tried to self-medicate with these prescription opiates, um, which seemed to, to help for a little while. Um, I was able to sleep. Uh, I was able to sleep throughout the night without having any type of vivid imagery. Um, so that, that is what I felt was what I needed to do in order to 
to continue out my life. So I, I, I found my solution and it would just be the, these prescription opiates. The problem was I was buying them illegally and had no medical rec- medical need for them. Um, that just was, they were helping me get, uh, get to sleep at night. Um, a lot of lying, a lot of hiding, a lot of, um, sneaking away, sneaking out, um, to get them, hiding them from my, from my wife, um, to a point that things started, um, to, to get, to get bad. And, and my, my wife confronted me over a lot of money missing from, from, uh, our ATM because I was, I was buying them pretty much every day and had really no explanation of where this money was going. Um, so at that point I just, I came clean thinking, okay, well now that, now that she knows I'll just stop. And I mean, this, the, the initial incident, um, with, uh, where I began using starting, it started in about January of 2013, where I started using the prescription or opiates, um, for self-medication. Um, and in just over a year progressed to, um, where we're about to go. Um, I, whenever I got cut off financially, or at least that my wife was monitoring the, um, the finances, I just thought that I would just stop. And that's where the true power of substance use disorder kind of hit me in the face. I, I, I couldn't just stop. I tried, I, I, I didn't want to use anymore. I thought, I thought I could just stop, but I absolutely could not. At that point, I was um, I was taking about five or six oxycodone 30 milligram tablets a day, and I tried to just stop it. Um, day one was tolerable. Um, day two, the the um, one of the the women that I was dealing with had made a suggestion and a recommendation that I uh, I write a prescription for her to, and we would both wean ourselves down and. Um, I said no initially, and uh, but day three, um, I, I gave in. I couldn't take it anymore. The the withdrawal symptoms. Um, I wrote a prescription for for oxycodone and really never looked back. Um, the plan was to wean ourselves down, um, and in a strategic fashion, come off of these medications. Um, it sounded good at the time. In, in hindsight, I can, I can, I can laugh at the insanity of it, thinking that it would actually work. Um, and really, at that point, it just opened Pandora's box. Um, I found a, an easier access to these medications, um, and so my my risk continued to increase. the The medication, the the normal dose, wasn't working anymore to get what I needed. Um, so we started writing prescriptions for more people. Um, they told a friend and they told a friend and they told a friend. Um, the numbers were increasing. The numbers of people I was writing for was increasing. The actual number of pills I was writing for was increasing. My tolerance was increasing. Um, started to, to write prescriptions in, in both West Virginia and Ohio. I mean, basically just this absolute reckless, careless, um, no regard for any type of, of law or authority. I wasn't running the show anymore. My, my brain had completely been hijacked by this, this chemical and I was willing to do anything and everything it took to get the next one. Um, so like all I needed, everything was, was more, I could not stop. I absolutely could not stop on my own. Um, and there were, there were, there were moments of clarity and moments of something bad's going to happen if I don't stop. Something is going to happen. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of fear involved. There was a lot of uh, stigma involved. There was a lot of fear of consequences. There was a lot of fear of being exposed for for the, the things that I was doing to get them. There was fear of judgment. There was fear of professional consequences, legal consequences. Um, also, there was some pride and ego and arrogance in the fact that Hey, I still have a job. I still have a, a roof over my head. I still have a vehicle. I still have a marriage. Like I can't be a, an addict, so to speak. I, I, can't, I can't be one of these people that that I see on TV and read about in the in, in on Facebook and all these crimes that the that that addicts commit. 
I couldn't be one of those because I still had a, a job. So I was delusional in the fact that that I was that th- this chemical had completely taken over my life. Um, and I mean, there was definitely some some red flags um, going on near the end there that uh, I, there were some opportunities. I I uh, I I'd, I'd left some some pills in the emergency department. My medical director had uh, rather than ask me directly if. Uh, if they were mine, he kind of skirted around the, the subject. I mean, cause it's a delicate situation. It's a delicate subject to, to ask a colleague and a coworker and a friend, are you, are you abusing prescription opiates? Because it's just a, it's a very uncomfortable position to be in, not just from a interprofessional standpoint, but from a um, patient uh, call or patient doctor perspective. Um, Nobody wants to be accusatory, so people we we tend to tiptoe around the 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 subject, and nothing really seems to get accomplished. Um, so he had asked me about them, and and I had denied. Um, I saw a way out, and I, I denied ever that they were mine, and um, just kind of kept going about my my business. Um, and at the end, I just kept using. I kept writing scripts. I kept using. Um, to the point that at the end of my active uh, substance use, I was um, I had stopped doing everything else. I, I had stopped drinking. I had stopped socializing. I was isolated. I had no friends anymore. If I was not at work, I was either trying to get get the next one, or hiding it, or 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 using or recovering from the the effects of it. Um, what started with one uh, Vicodin five milligrams to sleep in January of 2013 ended in February of 2014 um, with me taking upwards of 50 oxy 50 oxycodone 30 milligram tablets a day, um, which was just to the point where I couldn't stop on my own. Um, my life had become a mess. My family knew something was going on. They just didn't really know the, the severity of it. Um, nobody really wanted to confront me about it because my, my defense mechanisms were extremely high and I didn't want to, I, w- I wasn't going to admit to it anyways. I was going to do anything and everything it took to, to protect my, my dependence and my, my substance use. Um, it got to the point um, where in February of 2014, uh, I, I didn't want to live anymore. I couldn't, I could not stop using. I didn't know where to turn to for help. Um, I was too afraid to turn to for help. I was afraid of consequences. I was afraid of everything that I, I waited for my wife to go to work one day and wrote a suicide note, um, wrote a note to my mom, to my dad, both of my brothers and, and my wife. And, uh, I went in the basement and uh, I had a pistol in my mouth because I could not stop using opiates and I just could not imagine living life any longer. Um, and it got to the point that I, I just couldn't pull the trigger. Um, and so I just kind of resigned myself to the fact that I am going to die. I am going to die a prescription opiate addict. Um, and at that point, I was okay with that because there was my life had become a complete and utter mess. Um, luckily, I wasn't given much of an option after that. I I had wanted to stop using, but I didn't get to ask how I was going to stop using. On uh, February twenty first, two thousand fourteen, about two weeks after I had written a suicide note, I had gotten I was arrested. I was arrested by the. West Virginia State Police, the FBI, the DEA, multiple task forces, um, and I, I, I was went to uh, county jail that night. Um, the last, my last use of a of a of a prescription opiate was actually in the back back of a cop car, knowing that my life was about to be turned upside down. Um, I was still obsessed to 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 get it in. I was still obsessed to use. Um, I had I had a handful of uh, prescription opiates in my sock that I used in the back of a cop car. Um, and at that point, that was the last time I, I used any prescription subst- prescription opiate, any substance of abuse, any alcohol was on February 21st of 2014. Um, went to county jail, um, had an absolute 
brutal and horrible detox. Um, they, they say opiate detox will not, or opiate withdrawal will not kill you, but you will think you, you want to die. And I, that can, I can speak a hundred percent truth to that. Um, I, the, the withdrawal symptoms were so severe that I had to be taken to the hospital. Uh, I was so dehydrated that, um, I went into atrial fibrillation, my kidneys shut down. Um, I was in the hospital for a couple of days. I ended up having a cardiac catheterization. Um, so while opiate withdrawal won't kill you, it is still very, it can, it can cause a lot of problems. Um, luckily I was, I was allowed out. Um, I was allowed out of, uh, County jail with on an ankle bracelet, and I attended a 90 day inpatient uh, rehabilitation facility. Um, after that, while I was in rehab, my uh, my wife filed for divorce. I had to surrender my DEA license. My medical license was suspended. I was told that I would be going to federal prison. I just had to walk through the the uh, the hoops to to get there, and hopefully not. At that point, I was uh, I was facing a mandatory minimum of 15 years in federal prison due to the prescriptions I was writing. Um, and I was able after rehab, I, I was introduced to I did the cognitive behavioral therapy, the, the motivational interviewing. Um, I, I was introduced to a 12 step fellowship and other people that that definitely there wasn't the stigma. There wasn't the judgment. I was around people that that knew where I'd been and, and walked in similar shoes. And, uh, they, they helped me, um, they helped me, um, recover from, from this disease, this disorder. Um, ultimately I ended up, uh, I ended up going to federal prison. I went to prison for, I was sentenced to prison for 48 months. I, I was convicted. Well, I pled guilty to two counts, uh, one count of interstate drug trafficking because, my house was in Ohio, but I worked in West Virginia. So every time I, I crossed the, the state line, it was, uh, it was considered interstate drug trafficking. And then I was also convicted, pled guilty to uh, use of a communication device to facilitate drug trafficking. Um, I served about three years, a little over three years of my sentence. I served in uh, the Federal Bureau of Prisons between Cumberland and uh, New Jersey. Ultimately, I was I did come home. Um, I came home March of uh, 2018, um, and that point had a, a brand new uh, series of obstacles to um, to face. Uh, the The stigma of being labeled a, an addict, to being labeled a felon, to trying to navigate life in a post prison world. Um, I found that it was very difficult to find employment. Um, the a lot of uh, applications you had to check if you were a felon, and I mean there was a point that I'd filled out probably fifty applications, never received one phone call back because I had to check a box that I was a convicted felon. Um, and it just it makes maintaining the continued stigma and long term consequences of things that are that are done during active substance use make make are part of what makes um, maintaining remission or recovery from substance use disorder um, difficult because the the life it, it's it's the obstacles are are numerous um, I can I can say I just celebrated um, this past week last Monday I celebrated seven years uh, without any substances of abuse, um, no alcohol, no prescription opiates, um, been in recovery or remission from substance use disorder for over seven years now. Um, through some, some na difficult navigation, I did, uh, I found employment in a residential um, uh, treatment facility where we treat individuals with substance use disorder, um, dual diagnosis, mental health disorders. I'm currently working as a drug and alcohol therapist. Uh, I did get my medical license back. The state of West Virginia surprisingly did give me my uh, medical license back. Um, I just haven't found a way to navigate that. Uh, with everything I have in my in my history, I haven't found a successful way to navigate um, that as of this time. Um, adjunct professor at Duquesne University, teaching physician assistant students. 
uh, using some of my education and knowledge to help out there. Um, I am engaged again. I have a child on the way. Um, I'm happy again. I'm healthy again. Uh, I went, I turned myself into prison at 325 pounds. When I turned, when I, when I stopped using the, the drugs, my health went out of control. I, I just, I ate so much. And at that point, the, 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 the weight and the diabetes and the hypertension was going to kill me if I didn't do something about that. So thankfully all of this had to happen. I, I had to deal with everything that I had to deal with in order to get to where I am today. And, uh, honestly, like I can't, I can't, um, say enough for, for what recovery has done for me and that recovery is possible. It's just a matter of, of trying to, from a communication standpoint, trying to, to find that, that person that's be beneath the symptoms of substance use disorder because beneath all the, the the lying and the manipulation and the um, trying to get the next one and the obsession and the compulsion and the desperation, there there is a good person under there. It's just finding ways to to talk to them in a compassionate way and, and reach that person to to get them to to want the help that, that that's out there. Um, and finally, I can just um, Aaron kind of touched on this um, through through my experience. I can definitely say that. Uh, um, substance use disorder has absolutely nothing to do with willpower, nothing to do with strength, nothing to do with um, ethics, morals, or value, values. Once you have a, any type of trauma or early exposure or access, the, the brain changes in such a way that just stopping is not possible. Um, but there are cer certain um, medications and certain avenues that, that, could we, that are out there to offer help. It's just a matter of being able to identify those red flags and offering help or suggestions in a caring and compassionate way that we're able to, to reach the, the individual behind the symptoms of substance use disorder. Um, and another key factor that, that I definitely learned was that, uh, uh, substance use disorder does absolutely not discriminate against any race, race, sexual identity, creed, religion, any type of socioeconomic uh, standpoint. It can, it can, and will impact anybody. And I'm sure of the people that are listening, there's probably nobody that's listening here that has not been personally impacted by by substance use disorder in in some way, shape, or form. Um, so when you think about your communication with individuals with substance use disorder, just remember that this is somebody's brother. This is somebody's mother. This is somebody's father. This is somebody's, there's a good person under there. That's just trying to get back to that person. Um, and it's, it's up to us to, to try to reach that person in a caring and compassionate manner. Um, with that, uh, I want to thank, uh, Gina and Aaron and, uh, Amy again for having me and letting me speak and I can open up to any type of questions. Well, I want to echo the comments, exactly what I was thinking. We had, had several comments, um, in the chat, um, thanking you for sharing your story with us. Um, I, I love the way the, the one comment came in it says it takes a big man to come in front of an audience and lay your trials and tribulations in front of us like that kudos i'm proud of you congrats on staying sober so um my sentiments exactly i i know how much it had to take you're so brave for sharing your story with us um and i know that we all you know share those same comments and sentiments so thank you for sharing your story um and being willing to willing your willingness to be vulnerable to all of us to really share the importance of you know communications and providing that patient-centered care um and knowing that we don't want to stigmatize someone by their disease um, we want to provide care for the patient um, you know, and, and really look at the, I love the fact that you said, you know, you are someone's brother, you're a son, um, you're going to be a father. Um, so, you know, really looking at that patient as a person. So thank you for that. Um, a lot e it's a lot easier when I'm just looking at myself and not 700. Uh, yes, that's why we did this. You only have <laughs> to look at this. Well, there's only four of us looking at yeah. it directly, right? <laughs> um, we did have a, a question come in. It said, if you see warning signs in your patients, how do you bring it up with, with them without making them feel threatened or offended? Um, how can providers, what is the provider's next steps to get them the health, help that they need? 
Um, for me, I mean, if I'm looking at my story, there, there was definitely some, some opportunities for intervention. Um, but the way I deal with people now is, is that because I can identify with them on a personal level, I can, I'm able to uh, point out certain red flags and just kind of broach the subject a little more delicately uh, about substance use disorder and asking about um, problematic use consequences, using against their will. Um, and ultimately, uh, the, that, that readiness ruler, I mean, some people may know that they, they have substance use disorder. They are fully aware that they can't stop. And at this point in time, they're not willing to do anything about it. Um, just trying to find out where somebody is in, in relation to um, what they, they want to do about their disorder. Um, how willing are they to, to, to seek treatment? How willing are they to do something different? Um, because one thing about substance use disorder, uh, we tend to get very comfortable staying stuck in the problem. So being stuck in the chaos gets comfortable and anything outside of that is the unknown is fearful and uh, it's easy to just stay stuck where we are. Gina, you're muted. Thank you, I just realized that. <laughs> Um, so uh, uh, thank you for responding to that from, from the um, professional perspective. And I think this question is a great follow-up. What recommendations do you have for people who have someone close to them in life that struggles with substance use disorder? Um, they mentioned, I know it's a lot harder to separate personal feelings if you know them. Yeah, uh, all my opinion for that is letting them know that that you are there and that you're a, you're a support and that you understand what's going on and that there is help out there and that, that if they're willing to take that step, that you'd be willing to take that step with them. Um, one thing I've, I've learned throughout this is that I can't make anybody want to do anything about their, their substance use disorder. I can help people along the way, but I can't, I can't talk them into wanting to change. Um, once they're willing to take that first step, um, there is, you can be, we can be a support as, as, um, as loved ones, we can be supportive. We can be emotional supports. We can just let them know that they're not doing this alone because substance use disorder is a, it's a family disease. I mean, the, the individual suffers, but everybody, the family absolutely suffers around them, watching them go through what they're going through and it's just being absolutely powerless to do anything about it. Um, so just being able to be supportive and um, being there for them if they do reach out. And I think that really hits home. We had a, a, a comment that from someone who had been personally impacted and said that your willingness to really turn your life around has given them hope for their loved one who, who is suffering from substance use disorder. So, so it definitely very impactful and some great advice that you have provided. Um, Dr. Hogan, if you are willing, I would love to share your contact information with this, the audience as maybe there are some questions that folks don't feel comfortable asking, um, you know, in the larger setting. So with Dr. Hogan's permission, I will share his com contact yeah, that, information. That's, that's fine. Because I mean, again, I'm sure there's, if there's six, 700 people here, I guarantee there's a handful of people sitting there thinking, well, maybe, I, maybe I do drink too much. Maybe I'm, maybe I should do something now. I mean, there's, um, there, there's, it, it happens to everybody. Um, and like I said, it will, if, if something's not done, like it, it does progress. So yeah, if you could, if you want to share my information, you can be, uh, be more than happy to talk to people. Okay. So for the students, I will post that on the soul site for the IPE, um, 2020, 2021 soul sites. So you can look for that information there. So Dr. Hogan, to just thank you one last time. I know I've got, had the pleasure to work with you over the last year. Um, and I've absolutely loved it. And I look forward to continuing your partnership and relationship with, with WVU. Um, and we found a nice friendship, um, you know, 
through through working together on this project. So again, thank you for your your willingness to share your story with with all of us. Um, for the students, next step for you all, Dr. Hogan will actually be joining one of the rooms. So don't make it, don't let it make you nervous. Um, he just wants to see his year of working with us, um, you know, everything that it brings to light. Um, but you all will now be leaving this Zoom link or the, the YouTube link, and you will be joining your individual Zoom session for your group. The Zoom links are all posted on Soul under the Zoom links. And just a reminder, you have to download it to click on your individual Zoom link for your room. Um, you will be working with similar, the same facilitators as you have for the previous three sessions. When you go into the next phase of this session, you will have the opportunity to interview two standardized patients with substance use disorder. Each encounter will last approximately 25 minutes. During that 25 minutes, your assigned team will conduct um, an interview of the patient. So you want to be thinking through the tools that Dr. Wynn Stanley introduced um, through the expert tools and the motivational tools and, you know, kind of looking at the readiness ruler. Um, so you want to focus on, on those, making sure you're paying attention to avoiding the stigmatizing language and using all those tools that were posted on Soul for you. Um, so in that 25 minutes, you'll spend about 15 minutes interviewing the patient. Then you want to come up with a care plan for about five minutes, and then you'll get some feedback from your standardized patient about the interview. So each encounter should last about 25 minutes, and you'll be interviewing two patients, Molly Bunk and Katie Boyle. Um, both with their own unique personal challenges and difficulties. And then you'll go through a debriefing session with your faculty facilitator. So in all, the, the um, second phase will last approximately one hour. Um, we hope that you'll really use Dr. Hogan's presentation as motivation for how you will, you know, sensitively work through this encounter with the patients and use the appropriate communication tools and language when, when working with the standardized patients. Um, I encourage your participation. This session will certainly be um, all that you put in. You'll get out of it what you put into it. And I really hope it's a good educational experience for all of you. With that, if you could go ahead and exit this Zoom room and you will then enter your individual Zoom room for your group. And thanks again, Dr. Hogan. No problem. Gina. Yes. Donovan, is the recording stopped?